artificial intelligence. We objectively assess the importance of this topic. However, there is still no consensus on whether all tasks can be solved using these technologies. Abuse or obligatory use we will raise such issues of ethics, modern information society, and cybernetics. This is the story of our virtual conference on pattern recognition and information processing in 2021, which has already begun. Here. Right now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The year was 1991. The first conference on pattern recognition and information processing was held in Minsk that year. So students, researchers, scientists, and uh, well, engineers come together and establish cooperation between uh, scientific communities around the world. Starting 2009, the trip has begun fully international and fully, in fu fully English speaking. Nowadays, it is a well-known conference not only in CIS countries, but around the world, abroad. And uh, we have proceedings which are published in Springer's book. Unfortunately, after the 30 years of history of PRIP, currently we are experiencing quite managing and quite, quite uh, challenging times. So thus, we would like to see, to, uh, we would like to say that uh, this year, we have to go online. United Institute of Informatics Problems of the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus, Belarusian State University of Informatics and Trade Electronics, and Belarusian State University were quite a good venue. But now we will go online. My name is Alexey Belosirkovsky. I'm a chief event officer, chairman of the program committee. Together with my team, we will moderate everything which, what will be happen here next four days. I hope we will enjoy all your presentations as well as super exciting keynotes. Let us begin. Artificial intelligence. We objectively assess the importance of this topic. However, there is still no consensus on whether all tasks can be solved using these technologies. Abuse or obligatory use we will raise such issues of ethics, modern information society, and cybernetics. This is the story of our virtual conference on pattern recognition and information processing in 2021, which has already begun. Here. Right now. And now after this uh, awesome intro, I would like to introduce speakers of our first plenary, first, let's say, opening session. So, uh, General Director of United Institute of Informatics Problems, Professor Dr. Alexander Tuzikov, Chairman of the Conference. Academician of the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus, Professor Sergei Blameka, Conference Vice Chairman. And our distinguished guest, Academician of the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus, Professor Sergei Gapoyenko, who is the head of Belarusian Republic Foundation for Basic Research. So, Chairman, please, you have a floor now. Okay, thank you very much, Alexey. I'm very glad to uh, to host uh, this uh, uh, conference, uh, 15th International Conference on Pattern Recognition and Information Processing in our institute. So this conference has already uh, 30 years history, and uh, uh, now now we we host this conference in our institute. Unfortunately, as Alexei told, it's uh, difficult to organize the conference in offline uh, sessions. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's clear why, because of uh, pandemic constraints, uh, it's difficult to, to move, uh, to come to our uh, country, our city, our institute to participate in, at this conference. But uh, uh, from the other side, uh, we have uh, some uh, some advantages of uh, this uh, online uh, mode of the conference because we we were able to invite uh, and uh, uh, we got exceptions from from them uh, very bright uh, uh, researchers working in this area, and uh, we are happy that we will will have the opportunity to uh, to listen this uh, brilliant uh, presentation from our 
na plenary uh, speakers. Uh, our conference was uh, organized 30 years ago and uh, it was uh, like the main event of our as association of uh, image analysis and uh, recognition. And uh, that time uh, we organized it in English. Uh, however, we, we understood that it uh, would be very difficult uh, for us uh, to, to, to have this conference in English, but it was necessary to integrate uh, in this uh, uh, space of uh, international association of pattern recognition to be like uh, in the united family of uh, people working in this area and now we we are very glad that uh, we have this conference here in minsk and i'm i like very much to to open uh, this uh, conference and uh, i would like to give uh, the floor to uh, professor sergey ablamik who is uh, uh, head of our national belarusian association of image analysis and uh, recognition please thank you alexander it's my great pleasure to be here in the 15th international conference on pattern recognition and information processing as my colleague said 30 years ago exactly in autumn 1991 we organized here in this institute the first conference it called pattern recognition and in image analysis at that time it was all union uh, soviet uh, conference in the in this area it was the first one even and then we started to organize like belarusian uh, society ipr society this conference approximately 25 years already this conference is going under auspicious of international association for pattern recognition and we are very grateful for ip to ipr for uh, permanent support of this conference this conference uh, allows us to organize to invite to uh, to have scientists from uh, first of all of course central eastern european from other european countries and uh, i would say that <clears throat> especially this today conference we had uh, papers from more than 15 20 countries and this is really very good and you can see program and it's quite a good program and uh, of course and also uh, specifics of this year conference first time we organize conference online and it's really not easy but it's again it's a new experience uh, uh, alexander tuzikov said that it allowed us to invite distinguished speakers from all of the, the world and uh, there is no necessity to personally come in Minsk, but we, we will have nice, brilliant uh, presentations from uh, very famous scientists. So we are happy that already 30 years, uh, every practically two years, we have such a conference. And uh, I would like to wish um, success for our 15th international conference, pattern recognition information processing. And of course, I wish to good health for all participants participant of our, our conference and success to the conference. Thank you. And I will pass a uh, microphone to our distinguished, distinguished, distinguished guest, academician Sergei Gaponenko. Thank you so much, Sergei. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, it is my honor and pleasure to join uh, for some period uh, your excellent community. You uh, are really facing challenges, as uh, mentioned in the subtitle of your conference. And you see, I do not believe to IT community myself. I'm IT user, I would say, I'm physicist. When I was a PhD student, something like 40 years ago, I used uh, the first computer in my life. It was a big uh, collective use facility in our Institute of Mathematics and um, there was a big hole a lot of uh, metal boxes and you see uh, service team something like 10 people uh, continuously uh, served uh, to enable this facility to work i feel that at that time nobody could really foresee the tremendous progress in this field which uh, your community did actually for us and nobody foresee at that time that we will have computers in every pocket 
and actually computer will become and it is an image making gadget of junior schoolboy nowadays and this is actually challenge which you did which you uh, implemented and performed for everybody for everybody i represent here our basic research foundation which uh, supports many pro uh, projects research projects uh, we consider that basic research is the very first and i would say very cheap uh, stage of innovation chain and uh, we are happy to have many applications uh, from uh, senior scientists and also from young researchers uh, in the field of uh, IT and uh, I would like to add that we have very nice uh, preferences for IT activity at all in our country we have uh, unbelievable extraordinary preferences economical preferences and financial preferences for uh, IT business and IT services I wish uh, success uh, to your nice event and again thank you for inviting me and I'm really happy to be here today thank you Okay, thank you very much, distinguished guests. Um, so uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to tell some tips uh, to draw attention uh, for, for, to getting the best of the online event. Uh, we have speakers, presenters, let's say, or li and listeners. Uh, I hope that everybody who want to present, the, who would like to present their papers, already formalized themselves and uh, timing and has connected during the session, get together. And if you will have your presentation, um, other sessions, uh, you will have time to, to, to connect during breaks. We got this awesome studio. So it is a main focus of the conference. Uh, our team is moderating you and switching the focus to the current speaker. When you have a floor, uh, please share your screen and so present you material in, a, in a, any proper man manner. Uh, you have around 10 and 12 minutes to presentation for presentation and five, that's three minutes for questions uh, from the audience, uh, from participants at Zoom, as well as uh, um, from the audience at the stream. Yes, we have stream to the uh, to, uh, YouTube stream and now I'm addressing to the to that audience. Please do not hesitate asking questions in the chat, YouTube chat, which is on the right corner of, the, of your screen, and uh, join our Telegram chat. The link is in the YouTube description below. Um, so uh, go also to, to the website to navigate uh, through the website to find the program in the appropriate session and, uh, well, learn about speakers and uh, find abstract in the program session. At least, at least please subscribe uh, to our uh, YouTube channel and follow. We are also in the social nets, so post whatever you want about the conference, about this event uh, with hashtags uh, hashtag prep, hashtag prep 20, um, uh, 2021, hashtag prep 2021 online. So now I'm closing this session. Thank you, our distinguished guests. And I would like to open our, the first plenary session, which will be uh, chaired by our general director, Professor Tuzikov. So, Professor, again, you have a floor now. Okay, thank you very much, Alexey. I'm very glad to start the first uh, plenary session. And I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker, Jos uh, Rording, uh, professor, uh, who is working in the university, in Groningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, his talk, uh, uh, Generalization of Mathematical Morphology and their application to the processing of scalar vector tensor Im images. Yes, uh, I'm very nice. It's very nice to see you. I'm very glad. I, I, I would like to make a short uh, introduction about your, your activity. Um, I would like to say that Yos uh, received his uh, PhD in theoretical physics in 1983 from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Then uh, he had a postdoctoral position um, at the University of California in San Diego and after he joined the Center of Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam. And uh, since 1992, he was appointed uh, associate professor at the University of Groningen. And uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, 
since uh, 2003, he, 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 ha he has been full professor of scientific visualization and computer graphics. Uh, and uh, from also, I would like to say that uh, uh, f last, uh, last uh, three years, yours was uh, director of uh, Johann Bernoulli Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science in the University of Groningen, where he is currently holds a chair in scientific visualization and computer graphics. Uh, uh, I would like to say that Jose is uh, very well known in his contribution in various uh, areas or related to image processing and pattern recognition, especially in mathematical morphology, biomedical visualization, neuroimaging, and bioinformatics. I would like to say that uh, I'm also happy that I spent uh, in 1996 two months in your group working in the uh, area of mathematical morphology. Now I would like to give the floor to, to Professor Jos Rurdink uh, uh, to, to present uh, this uh, uh, talk on mathematical morphology. Please, Jos. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Uh, let me first say that I have also very fond memories uh, on our collaborations uh, in the 90s and uh, the contacts we kept over the years. So uh, it's with pleasure that I present uh, this talk. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, and let's see whether this works. Uh, I have to give permission. So, uh, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Um, we, will, we will check. Yes. Please wait uh, a bit. Mm -hmm. Share. How about oh, now? now? Now, yes. Now we see your your screen. Okay. Very good. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, mathematical morphology, which is one of the topics in image processing I've been working on for many years, actually, starting in my period at uh, the Center for Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam. Um, as Alexander mentioned, uh, I've also uh, later started to work on other topics like visualization and graphics, but today I will focus on uh, mathematical morphology. And actually, the goal of my talk is to uh, present a kind of a summary of uh, almost 30 years' work on this topic, um, starting from simple, uh, straightforward morphology, and then gradually extending it to uh, very different types of images. So uh, let's see. Um, I would like to start with uh, uh, just a very quick summary of mathematical morphology for those who might not be so familiar. So first of all, I should say that what morphology is doing is working on shapes in the images. So in contrast, say, to linear image processing, which typically works with convolutions, uh, free transforms, etc. Um, mathematical morphology works with the concepts of shapes. And it formalizes this by using uh, the mathematical theory of sets, that is for binary images, uh, and later also functions for grayscale images. Uh, but let's start with, say, binary images. What is very nice about mathematical morphology is that it allows uh, a very nice geometrical interpretation. So since it works with shapes in the image, uh, it allows uh, the researcher and also uh, the general, I say, interested uh, layman to understand uh, intuitively what these operations are doing. So on the one hand, we have this geometric intuition, 
which also allows us to invent new algorithms. On the other hand, we have a formulation of these intuitions in terms of uh, very precise algebraic notions. Uh, and those are typically used to implement the algorithms. Um, it can be extended to gray value images, and uh, I, I will uh, present this in a minute. So what are the basic definitions for binary images uh, in morphology? So first you start with an image space, typically denoted by E, could be n-dimensional Euclidean space or discrete space, Zn. And as we work with sets, uh, the mathematical uh, say notion which uh, is involved here is the power set. So you, you take your image space E, and then you consider all the subsets of that space E, and that collection of subsets is the power set P of E. We have an ordering on this space, uh, set inclusion. Uh, so this is important because later we are going to look at other orderings. Uh, and we have to define when we have a set X, what we mean by the translate of X, uh, which is denoted by X sub A. So if A is a vector, then we can translate any set over that vector and call it X sub A. And then we can define uh, the basic uh, operations uh, in binary morphology, which are dilation and erosion, which essentially are Minkowski addition and subtraction. So you see the formula X plus A, plus with a circle around it, is the union uh, of all translated sets XA, where A runs over the set capital A, which we call the structuring element. And for the erosion, you see the formula where you have intersections instead of unions, and there is the minus A uh, for convenience. Um, I'm not going to explain it in detail, but that has some advantages to have minus A here instead of plus A. As soon as you have these basic operations, you can uh, define composite operations. And the first important ones are the opening and the closing. So the opening, x circle A, is an erosion, x minus A, followed by a dilation, plus A. And for the closing, it's the other way around. And these operations uh, are different, so dilation and erosion. In general, I do not commute. Therefore, you can define these two uh, operations, opening and closing. So here's a geometrical interpretation for dilation and erosion. Suppose we have a very simple set X, which is a rectangle, and a structuring element A, which is a circle. Then the, geometrically, what the dilation is doing is taking the structuring element and putting it on all the points of X, and then taking a union of all those translates. And so the new set is defined by this curved border, which you see here. For the erosion, um, what uh, the operation is doing is it takes the structuring element and looks at all the locations where the structuring element fits completely inside the set X. So you can see here, what you get is a new rectangle. Uh, the Barnard case is where you put the circle here, where it just fits inside the original uh, rectangle X. For the opening, there's also a very nice numerical interpretation. Uh, so X uh, circle A, the opening of X by A, is the union of all the translates which fits inside. So in contrast to the erosion, you do not uh, 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 collect the points A, but the whole translated sets. So if you look at this example, a rectangle and a circular structuring element, you're going to put the structuring element everywhere inside X where it fits, and then you take the union. So you will get a new set, which is uh, this set where the, the corners are, are rounded because the structuring element can go further than this, po uh, this point. What is very important, uh, and also for my talk, uh, essential is to uh, look at the concept of translation invariance. So the idea of translation invariance is the following. If you take a set X and a structuring element, you can translate, um, say, the set so that you get a new set, X sub H, and then do a dilation, you get a result. Or what you can do is first dilate the result by the structuring element and then translate the result. And you get the same. This we call translation invariance. In this case, for the dilation, you have the same for erosion, opening, closing. Uh, so in formula, what uh, translation invariance says is if you take a dilation, and you translate it over a vector, 
what you can do is also first translate the set over that vector and then the, do the um, say dilation and the result will be identical. So this we call translation invariance. It's just tra translating sets over the image plane. Here's the, uh, the extension to grayscale images. Um, so now we have not a set, but a function, a grayscale function. Uh, and we have, uh, say, another function B, which we call the structuring function. Um, we use the same notation. So the dilation F plus B is, instead of having unions, uh, I like in sense, we now have the maximum. So you look at the function uh, at a certain point, uh, X, Y, and then you're going to look at all trans translate, uh, translation vectors inside the structuring function. Uh, and you collect the maximum of all those, uh, say, function values which you get. Uh, in this case, the structuring function is flat, meaning um, uh, it's like indicated here. It has a constant value. Uh, it can be generalized to structuring functions which are non-flat, but this is the simplest case. For erosion, uh, you get a similar formula. Uh, instead of maximum, you now have minimum. So these filters are sometimes also called max-min filters. Again, uh, while as, as soon as you have dilation and erosion, you can follow uh, uh, up by defining the opening and the closing. It's, uh, again, the iterates first uh, erode, then dilate for the opening, or first dilate, then erode for the closing. Um, so if you look at this one-dimensional example, um, essentially what the erosion does is it takes this flat structuring element moves it vertically uh, as long as it fits under the graph of the function. And then uh, the result uh, will be the, uh, the opening. So it will be kept here, um, say, uh, at the uh, local maxima. And for the closing is the other way around. It will fill, uh, say, valleys. On the right, you see an example where you have uh, an input image uh, on the top left corner. And then you have dilation, erosion, uh, erosion and uh, opening. So this is the, the summary of uh, standard morphology. Now to generalize this, uh, you can go many different ways. So essentially morphology has two, uh, two elements. It has the idea of sets or functions, and it has the idea of uh, some operation uh, on which the, uh, the, the operators are invariant. So for the binary morphology, it was translation invariance. You can replace it by other invariants. So you, you look at different ways in which you can, say, move uh, structuring uh, elements around, not just by translation, but maybe also by rotation, scaling, or even more general, say, um, uh, operators. And what you get is what is called group morphology. So I will give some example in a minute. You can also look at the spatial element and then look at structuring element which are not fixed any longer, but which may depend on position or maybe even depend on the input image. And then you get adaptive morphology. So I distinguish two cases where the structuring elements depend on the location or where they depend on the input itself. Um, and then we call, talk about input adaptive structuring element. It can also be extended to arbitrary complete lattices. So for the binary case, we had uh, the lattice of uh, P of E, this uh, collection of subsets. You can have other complete lattices, but I will not focus uh, on this in this talk. And you can extend it to other type of functions, not scalar functions, like in just grayscale images, but maybe vector function or even tensor data. Uh, so we will see how this can be done. So let's start with group morphology. I'm not going to focus on the mathematics, which is uh, quite involved, but just show you some examples so that you get some intuition about what is happening. So if you look at the top left image, and um, this is the case of Euclidean morphology. So uh, you have, say, uh, a black set, which may be the structuring element, and we can translate it to different, uh, say, locations in the image plane. So essentially, all those black squares are copies of the structuring element. Um, so apart from, uh, say, the translation, they're identical. Now, if you, if you look at the top right uh, image, um, you get circular morphology. So instead of translation in horizontal and vertical directions, you get two other operations. You can rotate the structuring element, and you can scale it with respect to the origin. So again, if you uh, say if this would be the basic structuring element, 
all the other black regions are essentially copies of the circling element. And now not by translation, but by uh, the say polar group of uh, rotations and scaling. So if you have this intuition of moving the structuring element around, when you have this group, this is what it means to move the structuring element around. I, there's a, another example, perspective morphology, where you have the group of perspective transformations. And again, the blacks, uh, say, regions in the image plane are just copies of the structuring element under the perspective group. What is important to realize is that in this case, uh, the structuring elements do depend on position. If you look at, uh, say, this representation, but they are independent of the input image. This is important to keep in mind. So if you want more details uh, on this, you can, for example, look at my paper on group morphology, where I summarized, uh, say, um, all the different groups which may be used in morphology. Um, also, uh, the three examples which you see here uh, are kind of special in the sense that the, the group involved is abelian. Uh, that means uh, it is a commutative group. And if you look at other groups, uh, they may become non-commutative and then things become really more complicated. So let's look at this case. So what other groups can you imagine? Well, for example, similarity group, which means translation, rotation, and scaling, or the group of infinite transformation, or you can try to work on a sphere, you get spherical transformations, or even projective groups. Uh, and in all these cases, the group is non-abelian, which mathematically makes things much more complicated. Uh, and again, I refer to my group morphology paper for all the details because there would not be enough time to, to discuss it today. One particular result which I found is that uh, if you look at the openings, as we have seen, uh, say, in binary morphology, the opening by a structuring element, same for closings, um, there is a property in, in uh, say, the Euclidean case that they can be decomposed in products of dilations and erosions, which are themselves group invariant. But for the general case where the group is non-abelian, this is no longer true. And there are other properties which also uh, no longer hold. Just an example, in this case, working on a sphere with uh, the group of, uh, say, <coughs> spherical rotations. Um, this is an example where on the left uh, you see a picture of the planet Mars. Uh, and you do a grayscale opening, a spherical grayscale opening, uh, using the theory of group morphology, and the result will be uh, like you see in B. So uh, the result of the opening is that small details are removed, um, uh, values are filled. Uh, if you would be naive and consider image A just as, uh, say, a binary image or a grayscale image, uh, excuse me, a grayscale image on the plane, and just use Euclidean opening, then you get the result in C, which uh, obviously is very different. And so you have to adapt the group to, uh, say, the geometry uh, of uh, your problem. And so this is the result you can achieve. So I will stop here talking about group morphology and now go to adaptive morphology. So for adaptive morphology, um, there are two cases, and the first one is location adaptive structuring elements. So you can imagine that uh, you have a space um, where uh, there is a function n, which associates to each point of the space E a set. Uh, and this set may therefore be different for different points. Nevertheless, you can define the operation like you did for uh, the standard uh, Euclidean case where the structuring element is fixed, of computing all the, the union of all the, uh, over all the points in the set X of the neighborhoods, uh, say N and we call neighborhoods, at that point X. So even although those neighborhoods depend on X, if you take the union of all those sets, you get a dilation. Uh, and why we call this a dilation? Well, the uh, defining property is that it's uh, invariant under union. So delta of X union Y should be able should be equal to delta x union delta y. And if you define the operation in this way, 
this property holds. So it, it is a proper dimension. Now, another uh, interesting uh, consequence of the theory, which actually was uh, developed by many other people like uh, Henk Heimans uh, from uh, CWI in Amsterdam and Christian Rons, and of course, originally by Jean Serra and his co-workers. Um, there is a notion of adjunction, meaning that as soon as you have a dilation, there is automatically uh, an erosion associated with it. Uh, below, you see the definition of adjunction. Uh, I'm just going um, to display the formula. So once you have this dilation, you can define the erosion of the set X, which is the collection of all the points such that uh, the neighborhood at Y is included, sorry, is included in X. Uh, and actually what you uh, observe in the literature is that very often people define delta and epsilon, so dilation and erosion independently. Uh, and sometimes they no longer form an adjunction, but actually this is not necessary. So again, as soon as you have a dilation on the complete lattice, there is automatically an erosion associated with it and vice versa. So if you look at grayscale functions, you can do the same. And the formulas are uh, almost the same, except that instead of union, you now have supremum or maximum, say. And instead of uh, intersection, you have uh, infimum um, or minimum. Uh, and again, uh, for, for example, for the dilation of a grayscale function at x, it's simply the maximum of all function values where y ranges over the, uh, the neighborhood, actually, in this case, the, the uh, reflected neighborhood. Uh, and uh, the erosion is the infimum of the function values over the neighborhood. And in this way, they form a proper adjunction. As soon as you have an adjunction, you can define opening and closing. You know this automatically. And you know also that those products, delta epsilon and epsilon delta, will have certain properties. For example, an opening is uh, idempotent. If you repeat it, you get the same result. It is increasing. Um, and you have uh, a number of uh, properties um, uh, like anti and the third one is anti extensivity. Those three properties will automatically hold. Now, there is another case which people uh, looked at in the literature, which is where the structuring element uh, becomes a function of the input image. And this is really tricky because it's easy to write down a formula like this. So instead of a, a neighborhood which depends on the location, it also depends now on the input uh, function. Um, and same for erosion. So the neighborhood function, the reflected neighborhood function. So it, it seems a, a small change, but actually this is no longer, this pair delta and epsilon defined in this way is no longer a junction. And so if you form, say, iterates like epsilon followed by delta or delta followed by epsilon, uh, the result is not an opening and a closing. And it took some effort uh, over the years of finding out uh, how this should be done uh, to do it properly. And actually, the, what you can do is the following. Um, first, you take uh, an image F0, uh, which we call a pilot image. And this first, uh, say, input image is used to define the neighborhood functions. Once you have these neighborhood functions, you fix them, and then you can define dilations and erosions in this way. So now uh, dilation depends on two uh, inputs, uh, the function, the image itself, say, and the pilot image. If you do things in this way, then indeed uh, you uh, have a proper dilation and erosion, and you can follow uh, formulate iterates so that you have opening and closing. So again, this is a very short summary. Uh, if you're interested uh, in the footnotes, there's a reference to a paper where uh, I worked this out. Again, an example uh, of uh, such uh, location or, or function dependent neighborhoods, uh, which are the morphological amoebas. Um, um, as presented by Lera Lu uh, and co-workers in 2007. So the idea here is that uh, you define filter kernels which adapt to the local image content. And since these shapes can be very different, um, they were called amoebas, uh, like, um, say, uh, what you have in nature. 
So um, the structure and function in this case is defined as follows. It's points, a set of points, where I say a certain amoeba distance uh, function is smaller than a given radius. And so this is where things become dependent on the image, um, because this amoeba distance is dependent on the image. Here's an example of the result. So top left, you have an input image. And then first, you have to compute a pilot image, where there are, in this case, there are two ways to do it. You can use a Gaussian filter, uh, top middle, or, or you can use this amoeba um, mean filter, where say this amoeba filter uh, depends on the image, image itself. And so you see that the pilot images are very different. And then below you see two results. Uh, bottom left is uh, the amoeba mean image with the Gaussian pilot. And right, you see it with the amoeba pilot. And so you see that uh, because of this amoeba pilot function, it captures better a certain, say, um, uh, input uh, uh, properties. Like if you look at the hand, you see that the Gaussian case blurs it more than, say, the amoeba uh, pilot, which uh, is really adapting to the image much better. OK, so far for, uh, say, uh, the adaptive case, um, now we look at uh, extending it to different uh, function spaces. So first, the vector value uh, case. Um, essentially, if you have a vector uh, valued image, the problem becomes how to order those function values. So remember, uh, in the in the binary and grayscale case, we had an ordering uh, for the binary case is the ordering of sets, inclusion of sets. Uh, for the grayscale case, it's just uh, the linear ordering of function values, um, since it's just uh, say the real numbers where we have the ordering. But if you have a vector, how do you compare vectors? How can you do uh, do ordering of vectors and later on tensors? This is really the problem. Now, I will uh, confine myself to a specific vector valued image, which is a color image. Um, and this slide presents the problem. So if you have, uh, say, um, two images, uh, where the orange one with the RGB values and the blue one with the RGB values, you can define a join or supremum and a meet uh, or infimum. Um, but what you see is that you get very different colors. So you get new colors in the image. Um, and this is really what people consider to be a problem, uh, the so-called false color problem. So the real problem is um, if you do this, say, um, a comparison by just working on the individual RGB components uh, and then taking the supremum or infimum, uh, you get new colors in, in the image, as you can see here. So you have orange and blue, but you get uh, pink, and uh, sometimes you get gray, where there was no gray in the input images. <clears throat> this is called the false color problem. Here's an example where you see what happens for a real input image. Uh, so if you define the dilation in this RGB basis, uh, using the definitions uh, I just presented, you get all kinds of new colors in the image, uh, which is a bit strange or at least non-intuitive. How to solve this? Well, many people have worked on it and many solutions have been proposed. Uh, I'm now presenting a, a solution which was uh, developed by my former PhD student, Jasper van der Gronde, who came up with the following idea. If it is the case that, say, results depend on, uh, say, a, a fixed color basis like RGB, um, why not construct, uh, say, a set of color bases? So not just a given one, like the one on the left, but simply consider uh, all the rotations of this color basis. Of course, a finite number of rotations in practice. Nevertheless, um, you consider now a group uh, of rotations of the color space and looking at invariance under this group. So it's in some sense also an extension of or an application of color, uh, group morphology. Uh, and this uh, collection of uh, rotated basis uh, functions is called a frame. 
So again, um, the first paper, journal paper on this was in IEEE transaction on, of, on image processing. Um, so here is uh, how it works. Uh, you take an input image, top left, and then you lift it to the frame uh, representation. So you get not a single image, but many images uh, where uh, which are generated by this by these rotations of the color color uh, space. Then in this extended representation, you filter the dilation, erosion, any other filter uh, you like, and then you have to go back to an image and then. Um, the theory says that there is no unique way to go back. Uh, so what we do is a least square projection, and then you get the results. So here's, uh, again, uh, the case of the, the bird, which we saw before. And on the left, the dilation in the RGB basis with the false colors. On the right, the dilation in the U invariant frame. So uh, we consider here only rotations of the, of the U's. Uh, of course, you, you can. Uh, also uh, extend uh, the invariance to the full color space, but here we only consider the use. Uh, and you still have the, the colors uh, as they were in the input image. So uh, I come to my final uh, example. This is tensor valid images. Um, now, before going to the, the morphological uh, operations, let me just give uh, a few slides uh, about how you can get tensor images. Um, this is uh, one way to, to uh, achieve uh, this, which is called diffusion tensor imaging, which is widely used in biomedical uh, imaging uh, and uh, neuro uh, neuroscience. Um, so this is also a topic um, my group has been working on. Um, just a few slides for introduction. So um, what you can obtain by a uh, magnetic resonance imaging scanner is um, uh, data which uh, allow you to, in each point, uh, measure the directions of water flow. And these directions um, give essentially a matrix of diffusion coefficients, which now depend on the direction. So what you get is a the diffusion tensor, which you can visualize by this ellipsoid. So if you look again in any point of the input image, uh, the 3D in this case, uh, you get um, this matrix uh, or tensor, uh, which you can diagonalize and you get the, the major axes um, of this ellipsoid. And so the largest one, the largest eigenvalue in this direction gives you the main direction of uh, water flow. Uh, so this picture uh, has colored, uh, say, the divisivities um, with these colors. So uh, red is left, right, green is bottom to top, and blue is orthogonal to the image plane. Now this is still 2D, so you can also uh, try to now follow, starting in a given point, where the, the main, uh, say, direction of water flow will lead you. And then you can uh, compute fiber tracks. So again, you start in a point, you follow the main direction of water flow to the next, uh, say, volume uh, point, uh, next voxel. Uh, and so you continue following, say, the main direction of water flow or diffusion. Uh, and then you can compute these fibers. So these are in the corpus callosum, which is a central part in the brain connecting left and right part. It has many fibers. Um, and you can also color these uh, fibers by their anisotropic direction, so indicating what the main direction of flow is. By the way, we also did some work on, um, say, enhancing this representation. Uh, this is just for black and white images by so-called uh, halos. So each fiber is projected on the background, uh, say, uh, on a black background or a white background, so that it's more emphasized. Uh, and then you get a very good insight in how the, the fiber bundles are running in the brain. Okay, back to morphology. So um, again, this is a complicated uh, exercise. Uh, I will restrict myself to saying that essentially do the same as for say the vector case, namely trying to compute a frame. So again, if, if you look at two representation of a tensor um, and you compute uh, say the minimum component wise, you get a result which is not very intuitive. 
While if you look at um, uh, our method, uh, it can compute uh, results which uh, still look like uh, a real tensor. So again, we construct uh, invariant operators uh, under rotations of, say, uh, the basic uh, tensor uh, basis. Uh, so it's, it's like in, in the, uh, the vector case, uh, both for, uh, for example, for meet and join. So here uh, you get uh, inputs and then a meet, and it's the same as the joining the, the meet and then do the, uh, the translation or the transformation in this uh, general, um, say, tensor uh, domain. So as you can see here, we, we now have uh, a rotation invariant frame, uh, which we can construct um, like in a vector case. And then uh, we do the same setup. So we have a tensor image, top left. We do a lift to the tensor, uh, uh, to the frame representation, excuse me. Uh, so you get all these ro rotated versions, you filter, and then you project back by these squares. Again, this was work of uh, Jasper van der Gronde. So a final uh, example, and here's a tensor which is not constructed from, uh, say, the diffusion tensor imaging, but just from an image, the so-called structured tensor. So if you have a grayscale image, uh, you can look at uh, directional derivative in all directions, A, uh, and uh, you can work out this formula. And uh, what comes out is a tensor, T of X, uh, and this tensor is called uh, the structural tensor. And so in the image uh, images, you see an example of uh, applying uh, our, um, say, frame-based approach. Uh, on the left, the original image. Uh, on the middle, you have the gradient magnitude, um, which has uh, zeros uh, and at the crossings. And on the right, you have the result um, uh, after we filter, uh, in our case, by a closing, uh, but in the frame representation um, uh, using the setup I just described. And then what you see is that, uh, say, uh, the zero responses are filled in by this filter. Uh, so you, you, you get rid of all these gaps, but the result is still um, sharp in the sense that the edges are still thin. So I, I've uh, come to uh, the end of my talk. So let me summarize uh, what I have been discussing. Uh, we started with standard mathematical morphology uh, using the, the invariance on the translations of the image space. And then we generalized this to other transformation groups um, uh, leading to group morphology. And we have seen different, many different cases, uh, abelian or commutative groups or non-abelian groups. Um, then we looked at adaptive morphology, where you have really to be careful uh, to distinguish between location adaptivity, where only the structuring element uh, or function depends on position, or uh, the case where, say, you have an independence on the input image, and this input adaptivity is much more complicated. You have to be careful. So you have to use these pilot uh, images in this approach. Then we looked at vector images, uh, for example, color images, where, say, these false colors are contrary to in intuition. And using uh, frames, um, uh, you get more natural results. Uh, of course, what is natural and non-natural is always uh, up to debate. But um, at least if you start from the assumptions that you want to uh, avoid these uh, false colors, then the frame-based approach is one way uh, to solve this problem. And finally, we mentioned tensor morphology as an extension of vector morphology, where, again, uh, you construct uh, rotation invariant frames from uh, certain tensor bases. So I've come to the end of uh, my talk. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Jos, for your very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to ask you maybe one, one question because we, we do not have much time. Uh, as, uh, as far as I remember the 19th, it, it was the, the time of uh, very intensive uh, research in the area of uh, mathematical morphology. 
with the conference, uh, many conference organized, uh, devoted to this subject. And I remember you also organized in the Netherlands the conference on mathematical morphology. And how how you you consider now? What are the main main direction where people which are interested in in the mathematical morphology are working on now? What is uh, the 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 most important? Uh, topics of research in mathematical morphology now? How do you consider? Okay, I think there, there are two answers to this. Um, on the one hand, uh, I, I think uh, morphology has become uh, applied to many different uh, application domains. Um, so uh, initially, I think there was a, was a lot of theoretical research uh, in which actually I was involved myself as well. Um, but um, people have really teamed up with, uh, say, researchers. For example, uh, in the medical domain, there, there are many uh, cases where, say, morphology is used. I, I showed only one example of this diffusion ten tensor case, but uh, I've had projects also with medical colleagues uh, where we looked at, uh, say, sharpening images or extracting say, blood vessels uh, or all kinds of uh, other, uh, say, uh, operations on medical images. Um, this is only one application. There are other applications in, in astronomy, material science. So I think this, this is important. It's really um, very good to see that, you know, the, the framework of morphology is applied in practice. On the theoretical side, uh, I think there are also still interesting developments. Uh, I think from um, the 90s, one particular one is um, the so-called connected filters. Uh, so um, these are filters which um, uh, try to um, keep or remove certain, um, say, connected uh, elements of the image. And there has been a lot of uh, research on these connected or hyper-connected uh, filters. Um, then I would say there are also there are still also a lot of research on uh, effective algorithms, also for these more complicated, say, operations. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, still a very active um, uh, field of research. And well, as you mentioned, uh, the conferences uh, uh, which started in the nineties they still exist. Uh, every two to three years. Uh, actually, we organized it twice in the Netherlands, uh, once in Amsterdam, once in Groningen. Uh, and so um, I think uh, the field is still uh, quite active. Okay. Thank you very much, Jos. I, I would like also maybe other people listening, your presentation would like to, to ask uh, questions. Uh, not not much, but maybe one 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 additional questions, please. Okay, no, I think no no other questions. Yes, uh, I would like to to thank you very very much once more for for your uh, very interesting talk on mathematical morphology, and I was also very happy to to see you uh, participating at our conference. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>so colleagues uh, i think we will like to, we need to proceed and uh, the mr chairman you may you may uh, announce the next speaker if we have no questions because well uh, participants please those who are in zoom you may uh, you may ask questions uh, just uh, just holding your hand or just um, open your mic and just ask questions now uh, i think next speaker will come because uh, we are a bit out of schedule now Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alexey. We now uh, come to our next uh, plenary presentation. Uh, I would like to announce uh, uh, the title of presentation of Professor Frédéric uh, Leymarie uh, towards creative robots and artificial intelligence, intelligence with the human touch. I, I, I do not know whether with the uh, oh Frederick, I I see you. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice to see you. 
Good to see you again. Uh, Frederic, I would like to, to make a short introduction uh, before, before your talk, uh, okay. because uh, um, I'm very uh, glad to introduce uh, Professor Frederic Leymarie, uh, who is uh, working uh, from uh, 2004 uh, uh, at the computing department at Goldsmiths of the University of London. And uh, the areas of interest of uh, Frederica, I've taken them from from the website, uh, computer vision and computer graphics, artificial intelligence, machine learning and creativity, artificial skillful robots, interactive platform for biosciences, intersections of uh, visual art and lives performance performances with computing perception and robots. So a broad area of uh, research interest. I would like to say that uh, Frederick uh, got his uh, PhD in 2003 uh, from the Brown University in the United States of America on the, on the, with the title Three Dimensional Shape Representation Wire Shock Flows. And uh, I would like to, as far as I remember, you graduated uh, McGill University, right, in Canada. And, uh, uh, because I, I remember, uh, we, we met many years ago. It was about, uh, about 30 years ago in the center of, uh, mathematical morphology in, in France. Uh, uh, that time you were still, uh, uh, probably just, uh, uh, finished your, your master study. Yes, and uh, yes. Uh, and uh, your your scientific career was uh, still ahead. Uh, yes, and and now you are full professor at the University of London. But what I would like to say, because I I teach also uh, a course of on basics of image processing, and we students we still uh, we still uh, study your your paper which was published when you were a master student on distance transform it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very good very good paper <laughs> and uh, we 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 study it with uh, with our students so i i would like now to to give the floor to uh, professor uh, uh, Le maria for his very interesting talk on uh, creative robots and artificial intelligence with a human touch please uh, Please, Frederick. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to meet again, although it's online, virtual. I remember uh, our meetings in uh, Fontainebleau with Professor Serra, and this was a great time indeed. So thanks again for having me. Uh, let me start and share my screen. Hopefully that's going to work. Right, okay. so I think you should yes, see yes. my we screen see, now. We see, see your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yes, I, I will talk about uh, topics that are different from a previous talk. I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Rodrink. Uh, we met uh, not so long ago at the PhD Defense and uh, I follow the field of morphology as much as I can and still uh, use um, that part of image processing in some of my work. It's actually in some of the work I present underlying it, uh, morphology plays a role. Um, so I would like to also to add, I added a subtitle. So this is part of a long-term research program which I entitled Art Machine intelligence and it's really about the intersection of, of all these fields so uh, let me uh, move on um, how do these three areas might come together um, art uh, let's say a, a little bit about art uh, so i take um, let's say a um, a view on uh, what we mean by art i'm mainly here speaking of art as an activity where we produce uh, artifacts. Uh, I'm not considering art that uh, goes into uh, art galleries or uh, the issues of uh, social impacts 
the marketing environment. So all these areas are very interesting, but at a different level of what I'm considering. So I'm considering really the, the basics of art, what we mean by art when we create uh, different artifacts. Um, here I put a few keywords to sort of emphasize aspects of art that are relevant to my discussion. So you see the words of creativity coming up with uh, new concepts. There's a side of uh, actions, and this relates to uh, how we use our body in uh, creating these artifacts, and I'll come back to that. There's a notion of skills. Uh, you can get better and better. You can gain expertise in uh, activities of creating art. There's issues of communication. Art is to be uh, observed and appreciated by others. You can communicate ideas, concepts via artistic activities. Uh, you can think of uh, sketches, diagrams. So I take a sort of a broad view of art uh, here. Uh, there's notion of aesthetics. What makes an outcome, an artistic outcome uh, interesting or uh, we would say beautiful, um, skillful, there are uh, ideas uh, from the world of art over many centuries that I think are relevant to AI in general and computer vision in particular. Uh, the, this notion of representations, how we represent concepts. Uh, and art is part of uh, every, everybody's experience in learning about the world. Uh, I'll say a little more about that in, in a few seconds. Uh, so the other main topics is uh, what I call machines. Machines really start with uh, way, way back in our history, even prehistory, uh, with the concept of tools. So it starts there uh, and it progresses through time and uh, really machines become extensions of our body. Um, so I'll just put that there out there and we'll come back to it. And in... Uh, in terms of intelligence, what I want to focus on here is those aspects of intelligence that differentiate, uh, differentiate us from other species. Um, so all species have some notion of intelligence. We could discuss that. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion in, ger in general, in science. Um, uh, but what I want to try to emphasize here is, can we focus perhaps on what makes us different, what we can identify uh, as intelligent actions that are different from other species. So the discussion also is in terms of a uh, historical view on the evolution of what we nowadays call, nowadays call, call AI or artificial intelligence. Uh, here I, I put a starting point uh, in 1950 with a famous paper by Alan Turing uh, on the notion of imitation, so-called now so-called Turing tests or uh, versions of the Turing test, uh, what he called the imitation game. And really here Alan Turing is proposing the idea that uh, in order to develop machines that show signs of intelligence, uh, we can cons consider um, a concept of imitation. And this is, a, again, the, the so-called famous Turing test. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but that's something we could return to later. A few years later, we have actually the proposal of uh, what artificial intelligence will become. Uh, so you have a famous meeting uh, uh, in the East Coast of the USA, in Dartmouth College, and it is proposed there that um, AI or artificial intelligence should be uh, the field of study where we basically uh, simulate aspects of intelligence, here meaning human intelligence, that we have some understanding of using uh, the machines of the day, which, are, uh, which is the, the beginning of computers. So here's a slightly different view on how to see uh, artificial intelligence. The idea here is let's simulate aspects of human intelligence, or potentially other animal intelligence that we have some understanding of and sort of verify 
uh, that understanding via a uh, machine, which would be uh, typically a computer. So what uh, we can consider nowadays is what I call AMI, art, machines, and intelligence, their intersection. And what I, I'm proposing here is that aspects of art can be combined, uh, such as creativity, practice, the practice of art, ar artistic activities. The notion of expertise can be combined with machines, their design and during, their control, their applications. I'll return to these uh, topics later on and can come together to better understand what human intelligence is. So this is a, a sort of complementary view on, on, on the previous views, where by combining these fields, we might be able to actually understand what intelligence is made of, or, or at least some elements, some basics of aspects of human intelligence. So that's sort of the agenda. The, again, it's my uh, long-term uh, research program. And I want to uh, specialize it today in the context of uh, a particular activity in the world of art, a very important one, uh, which goes back all the way to the origin of art, uh, which we can date, by the way, to tens of thousands of years ago, uh, the activity of drawing. So why drawing? Drawing is uh, one of the main activities uh, humans uh, use for, to express creativity. Uh, as uh, it will become clearer later with some examples, it is a, a process-based activity. Uh, that, that's sort of an enduring view on, on the activity of art. It is uh, meant to be appreciated, what I call reflexive. So this is bringing in notions from uh, psychology. Why do we uh, observe art and uh, how can we uh, distinguish features uh, and, and, and give notions of appreciation, quality to a piece of art? So this calls in uh, the field of uh, perception in particular. Uh, in the context of my uh, research agenda, I propose that this is uh, a, a very interesting activity where we have lots of examples and knowledge which gives us uh, a window into our mind, uh, opens up a new possibilities to study, again, human intelligence. Also very interestingly here is that of all the art practices that we could study, uh, this is one of those that uh, is shared by everybody. So essentially, we, if we look at uh, young children, uh, the activity of drawing is an activity practiced by all uh, typically, I mean, it would be very unusual that we, we don't let a, a child uh, explore um, concepts by a drawing. So that's typically something we've all experienced. We can directly relate to the activity of drawing. It is also an activity that uh, we use in, in, in youth uh, from a very early age uh, to uh, build up uh, representations of the world. So it's, there are very uh, interesting studies, especially in the world of, uh, in the field of psychology, studying how children uh, evolve their representations of the world of concepts. Uh, and this can be studied and observed by how um, their um, drawings uh, evolve through uh, first years of life. So uh, there's a good source of, of knowledge that, that we have used, in fact, in, in some of our research. It's an activity which is culturally bound, so uh, different than la later, if we consider later periods in, in the life of a person, uh, their drawing practice will start evolving, influenced by culture. Uh, so this is a topic we could also consider here. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, it is also importantly for my discussion in our research program, it is an activity which is clearly performed by an articulated body. So I just want to give you rapidly some examples of very different types of drawing, uh, just to sort of uh, lay out the field that, of what is out there that we could consider to study. Uh, so here's a, a sketch uh, by a famous uh, uh, Spanish uh, artist, Pablo Gargallo where we have a, 
an exploration. So typically a sketch uh, in the context of an artistic studio is um, a way to explore a, a possible concept that later will be refined into a final piece, could be a painting or, or a, a more uh, precise uh, drawing. And here we see all kinds of lines. If we were to study them uh, in, in small region individually at the pixel level, uh, it's not very sensical, uh, but if we look at it uh, as, as a global view, uh, we get uh, very strong uh, information. So that posed then the question, how, how does the human uh, brain process uh, such images? And with uh, the art practice, we can actually study that by the way of how is it produced? Another example, so this is a technique uh, sometimes called line of action. You see uh, a main line in being drawn through uh, the body here. This is actually the first line that is put on paper, so-called line of action. And that determines the essential pose attitude of a character. It's uh, sometimes referred to also as part of what's called gesture drawing. So then you have these uh, rapid movements here to flesh out the body. But this line of action is a technique that has been employed in particular in the world of animation, uh, was made popular by uh, Disney Studios since the 1930s, where you would uh, draw a few of these lines on blank uh, set of piece of paper and you would therefore characterize how is the pause of a character changing over many frames towards uh, selecting uh, how a character is going to move into the final animation. So again, uh, another very technique, uh, very uh, interesting technique uh, that we find in the, in, in the world of art that has uh, uh, strong features. Uh, we recognize Im immediately uh, what it is about. Here's a, a completely different technique, uh, also quite old, actually much older. You find such description of objects via primitives. Here's the notion of volumetric representations as primitives um, to assemble essentially a complex object into its parts. And this was already uh, familiar to uh, Renaissance uh, people uh, such as Leonardo, for example, or even uh, before him. So again, a different technique, uh, which will evoke to some of us uh, notions that have been uh, explored in, in computer vision for representing objects, for example. Final example here from the, the world of art, just again to sort of uh, try to convince you that there's a lot of richness uh, to, 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 to get from um, centuries of uh, evolution of art uh, techniques. So here is the, the problem is representing movement, uh, different pauses again uh, in one uh, canvas. And uh, this is uh, illustrations taken from a, a course given at the Pratt in Institute in New York. As an example, uh, you would use uh, these kinds of representation, for example, for uh, setting a scenario for, for stage uh, performance. So different techniques, uh, people who are familiar with uh, mocap, Motion capture systems uh, will will see a connection here, I think. So, in the the rest of my talk, I want to mainly uh, give you some com concrete uh, research examples, and uh, I'm going to cover two main uh, projects. Uh, and to do that, I'm first going to set a method, a methodology that we have followed in these projects and a few others. Um, so the way we proceed is uh, first we select uh, an area of uh, particular art practice uh, and then we enter into discussion with experts. Here the experts will be artists uh, who are experts in the particular type of practice. In a series of discussion with uh, artists, we then seek to uh, take the point of view of an engineer and uh, try to distinguish uh, different processes that the artist goes through repetitively uh, when they uh, think and then put on paper um, an artifact. So this this uh, will vary uh, how what we you you come up with in terms of a uh, a representation of uh, 
the thinking and the uh, process. It will vary with uh, the given artist and the given type of uh, art practice. At that stage, we try to uh, isolate uh, different aspects of, of these processes in what I called uh, here prim primitives. And you can imagine uh, building a sort of block diagram of relationship between uh, these different primitives. I'll give you an example uh, shortly. We're then ready to have computational models put in place and we will test them, implement them, refine them. The usual uh, iterative mode of uh, testing uh, methods via uh, computations. Once we start uh, reaching um, uh, good results or interesting results, which reflect well on how a human would produce uh, the same type of uh, artifact, we then evolve our computational models towards embodied systems, uh, typically into uh, robotics, into robot, uh, different types of robots. Uh, and we say that at that point, uh, once our uh, robotic uh, systems are giving uh, good, uh, good artifacts, uh, we have ways to test the ground truth of our uh, initial program, which is, uh, do we have a good model for um, how the human produces such artifacts? And uh, can we verify that we have uh, a deeper understanding of how the human uh, uh, achieves such artifacts? So, sorry, I, I went a bit fast here, but uh, I want to say just a little more about the uh, robotic side. Um, uh, of our uh, uh, agenda here. So why go all the way to robots? Why not just stop with uh, computational models? Well, with robots, we actually uh, push ourselves uh, uh, a little more. And there's also certain aspects of uh, the art artistic creation that which uh, are captured with robots, which are not easily uh, simulated, if you want, with uh, purely computational models. Uh, so with robots, we can actually also put ourselves in theatrical performance settings. And this is obviously of importance for artists themselves who want to use such contraption in, in, in their practice. I'll give you some examples. But also you can think of uh, the world of psychology when we want to um, do testings on uh, those models that we're embodying in robots and comparing them with how humans observers this time react to uh, those artistic uh, applications. So it has a, an impact on, on the psychology side. And uh, I can point you towards uh, recent papers uh, on that from later on. It introduced, uh, I think robots uh, implementation introduced constraints that are not necessarily considered when you have a purely computational model. You have to actually deal with uh, a body, the body of the robot. Uh, you have to control it. You have to have uh, sequences of, of movements. Uh, the body, if you want, can get in the way. Uh, if you think of a robot which is drawing or painting, uh, all considerations would, would not be really there as constraints if you're in the world of computations only. Because you're uh, driving a physical uh, object, the body of the robot, uh, there will be a lot of uncertainties due to the architecture of the robot and, and its uh, dynamics, which again uh, are part of the construction of the robot and not necessarily easy to, to simulate or, un or understand it from a purely computational viewpoint. Uh, so, whoops, hopefully that, I'm going back right now, yes. Hopefully that explains better why uh, we go all the way to robotic implementations. Um, there is a sort of philosophical uh, also point of view here. Uh, I will not spend too much time here, but uh, if you consider um, viewpoints today that are considered in the, in the field of AI, uh, there is this uh, group within the AI community that considers that intelligence should be studied via so-called embodiment. And then there's a sort of a contrarian viewpoint, which says that the computational uh, viewpoint is sufficient, a computational only viewpoint. So here we're following the embodiment hypothesis that intelligence, uh, I'll summarize here very shortly, intelligence is in part due and constrained by our body capacities in using tools, 
sensing the world, aiming to interfere with it. And here's an example from a famous artist, uh, how the body uh, plays uh, an important role. Uh, it's the body active in space. So it is really a, a dynamic uh, system. Uh, Jackson Pollock from around uh, 1950s and the famous uh, practice he, he popularized called action art. So my first uh, project I want to briefly cover uh, goes back to about 10 years ago. It's a co collaboration with uh, artist Patrick Tresset. Uh, Pat uh, Patrick was a um, active, uh, had already had a career as an artist, uh, but also had been educated in programming. And we met uh, when I came to London. And eventually, after a few years, we, we were able to uh, set up a structure with funding. Um, and we studied uh, portraiture. So how Patrick was uh, doing portraits of people. Uh, and we went through the process of um, understanding uh, how he thinks, how he uh, proceeds from an image, from looking at someone towards uh, describing uh, the essence of uh, sort of a skeleton of a face that you see here at the top as, as a sketch here. Uh, what other parts of his actions are important? Visual perception, where we have constant feedback on the image of the face. Uh, issues of uh, moving the body in particular ways to do uh, drawing ac actions. Uh, so you can imagine that a uh, given artist looking at the same person, uh, each time they do a portrait, they will go through different uh, dynamic processes and they will never really do exactly the same portraiture. Uh, and then there, in, in our discussion, it became clear that uh, Patrick was thinking in terms of uh, also uh, higher level descriptions of the face, what we call here mental imagery, so-called schemata, which comes from the, the field of art. Uh, there's a notion of experience. Uh, so a, a given artist will be influenced by other artists uh, by their own education. So we wanted to put all this together in a project and, and study these aspects as, as sort of primitives and, and try to uh, come up with a system that would duplicate uh, this way of thinking and acting. This is an early result. That, that's a purely computational model, which was implementing uh, our view at the time of uh, how Patrick goes about portraiture. And you, you will notice here, if you look at the details, that uh, the, the drawing gestures are very repetitive. This is the sign of a computational model or purely machine model, which has, which is uh, approximating what uh, the type of sketches Patrick was doing, but doesn't have the same uh, qualities. So we were trying to uh, understand what distinguishes a, a purely computational model from a, uh, a human uh, performance. And uh, we had uh, the sort of Eureka moment of thinking that perhaps if we move to uh, embodied uh, version of our uh, modeling, we would, we would approach uh, better uh, how the human uh, creates such artifacts. So what you see here is our first uh, system, first version of uh, an embodiment of the previous computational model that we had explored for a few years. We called at the time that system uh, icon for the uh, automated iconograph. Uh, later, uh, this system was re uh, called again uh, Paul the Robot. So if you look it up on the web, you'll see Patrick Tresset's uh, studio and you, you'll see his different versions of such robots called Paul the Robot. It's a series. And what it is, is uh, it's uh, articulated arm holding a pen. It has a wrist. Um, it has also a camera eye that can rotate around and find faces. And that camera eventually... Uh, we used uh, uh, in looking at uh, the drawing and influence, influencing the uh, drawing. So here's an example of that system. It captured a face of a person, and now it's observing the drawing while it's drawing it. Under the table here, uh, so Paul the robot is 
this eye, camera eye, this arm drawing, manipulating here a pen. And under the table, you have the sort of brain or the rest of the nervous system, which is the computer. These drawings uh, typically take anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, there's a performance aspect to it. Uh, there's uh, attention of, of, of the um, person, which is uh, important in the performance here. So they experience uh, a portrait uh, rendering, which is similar to uh, what they would experience with a human. So what, ha what happened uh, with this project, we, we worked for a few years together. Our last uh, research contribution is a journal article from 2013 in, in the Journal of Computer Graphics, uh, where we had our first description of using visual feedback, that is using the, the camera eye, not only to just capture a face and, and use some of its features to drive the robot performance, but also the, the camera eye was used to look at the qualities of the drawing as we make it and the robot could adapt, uh, refine uh, the drawing gesture. So there is a, a journal uh, article explaining this. Patrick then uh, went back to the world of art and has been very active since. Uh, we can look him up. Uh, currently, his studio is, is based in Brussels and he typically has uh, exhibitions of his new versions of robots uh, around the world. Uh, so here's a, a more recent example where he's using some machine learning uh, technique in combination uh, this time, so he has refined the uh, power if you want, of, of his uh, robotic model, where here the, the model, uh, so the robot is considering a, a sketch that has been drawn by Patrick, and then inspired by that sketch, uh, we'll do a uh, augmented version using the uh, style uh, that has been developed by Patrick via these robots. So this is sort of a early example of a collaboration, human-machine uh, collaboration in that world of robotic portraiture. So to, to I, I said that I would cover two main projects, so I will now, uh, in the next few minutes, cover the second project. So what happened uh, after 2013 is around that time, uh, I, I, I was lucky enough to, to meet another brilliant uh, artist and programmer, Daniel Berrio, this time an Italian fellow. Um, and we started around late 2014 to have discussions. Uh, the, the art uh, practice that Daniel Berrio is an expert of is uh, so-called graffiti art. I'll give you some examples of what we mean by graffiti art in a few seconds. And the research agenda here was to go beyond what we had done with Patrick. Uh, so with Patrick, we had uh, sort of explored me the methodology the full methodology of thinking of what are the processes that uh, an artist considers. Uh, can we build a computational model, verify it? Can we import it on um, a robotic assistant? So here we're going to go through all those steps, but we're going to refine the research agenda by focusing on movement. What is the influence of movement on the quality of the traces that we produce? This was a question uh, we, we put forward at the beginning of our research. Uh, at the time, we knew already from research, especially coming from the world of uh, cognitive science, that uh, there were indications that uh, as an observer, you appreciate uh, artifacts, especially in the world of drawings and calligraphy, by recovering uh, the movement, the likely movement used to produce the different traces, the different strokes of that artifact. And this has been a, an hypothesis that's been uh, around since at least the 1990s. So we were influenced by, 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 by these results. And, and just to try to convince you why this might make sense, here's an example of a calligraphic uh, artifact. And if you start asking, so if you now put yourself in a psychology experiment, you, you start asking different observers, how was this produced? Uh, they will uh, uh, come up with descriptions of traces uh, and even the sequencing, which uh, will be uh, fairly homogeneous across subjects. Uh, so it looks like we are able to uh, figure out how was this produced. Uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, so in fact, in terms of aesthetics now, um, the fact that we uh, 
understand how a piece of art is produced by a likely movement uh, gives us pleasure. And, and this is, again, part of the hypothesis uh, as it, it's described in the world of cognitive science. We could discuss that further. So we, we took that as a starting point. We established along the years um, different collaborations. I want to briefly highlight them. With EDAP in Switzerland, we, we work with uh, Sylvain Calino, an expert in robotics and in uh, applying uh, machine learning to robots, especially learning from examples, that is learning from humans. At Polytechnique in Montreal, we work with Professor Réjean Plamondon, who's a pioneer and um, expert in uh, what's called graphonomy, which is the science of studying how humans write. Initially, that was the, the main purpose. It has evolved now in all kinds of activities related to writing, so essentially Drawing would be part of that field, and that is why we, we were interested in working with him. Uh, Johan Wagemans, a psychologist at Leuven University, uh, uh, we've uh, collaborated with on, on the psychology side. Also, uh, one of his ex-student, uh, Rebecca Chamberlain, who is now at Goldsmith. And more recently, we work with some researchers, Paula Sente, Jose Echevarria at Adobe Research, uh, on results, I won't really show much now because I'm, I'm running out of time, but uh, this is evolving the, the work I will illustrate next from one dimensional traces to uh, 2D uh, uh, traces of, of letters in particular fonts. So the next few minutes to, to end my talk, I will exemplify the same method uh, we saw illustrated for portraiture in the context of graffiti. What is graffiti? I consider it as a modern form of calligraphy, the very ancient art of calligraphy. Graffiti is made of very rapid gestures over large areas using all kinds of tools, uh, spray painting, for example, brushes, uh, different materials, different surface types. Um, why focus on this particular art? Uh, well, again, our focus is to understand the dynamics of movements and how it influences the quality of the traces. So we think this is an excellent uh, modern uh, area practice to, to explore. Here you see Daniel Berrio and some of the art um, uh, that he can produce. So these are very large canvas, uh, beautifully, uh, beautifully done. And one thing that's quite extraordinary is to see it being done. It's, uh, they do these things very, very rapidly. The expertise level is very high. I cannot go into a lot of details, of course, time is limited, but uh, underlying uh, the particular uh, processes we, we try to, to, to model, uh, we have focused in particular on so-called sigma log normal model. So this is uh, influenced by Professor Plamondon at the Cold Polytechnique. And this is one of the popular uh, mathematical model that is believed to be a good way to represent how humans uh, use speed when they uh, do uh, writing traces. Uh, what you see here, in fact, is, I'll explain a little bit more. You have a simple drawing gesture made of two, of two main traces with three targets. So a big a start, an intermediate target, final target. And you see here a particular way of doing a gesture which lay a trace trying to reach these targets. What you see here on, on the right hand side is the sigma log normal, which indicates how the speed is varying. There are, uh, there's more to say about the, that model. It's been uh, studied over decades now and why it might be a good model to represent how humans uh, move their uh, limbs. Uh, I won't go into that, but there's lots of literature if you're interested. So what you, we observe here is that with the same targets, we have three different very different uh, renderings of, of reaching the same targets. And the only difference here is uh, how we uh, play with the sigma log normal, which represents the two main movements. So movements from the start to the middle target and middle to the end target. So each of these um, Gaussian lights, so sigma log normal is actually an asymmetric version of a Gaussian. You can think of it that way to summarize. Uh, how you 
distinguish the traces can be understood as how the kinematics is performed via this model. And here's an example with a, a more complex set of traces. This would be a typical so-called tag or signature in graffiti. And you have a number of uh, gestures that have been produced and we're uh, capturing uh, a particular rendering with the uh, targets shown in red here using sequences of these uh, sigma log normals. So that's the underlying uh, computational main computational model to understand movements here. Uh, so we have, I'm going very briefly, we, there's, uh, I can indicate a website where you have literature, a series of papers if you're interested in the details. But what we've put in place now is the computational model. We can observe how a human uh, expert produces uh, such uh, graphic art. Uh, we end up with, we can use image processing to retrieve number of targets from the human production. And then we can start recovering uh, uh, the kinematics of how it was likely produced as an observer might do using the sigma log normal model. And so finally, with all this technology, we can actually test and embed these models in, in uh, robotic system. So here's a, a first a, a virtual simulation of animating such robots, just to give you a feel. Uh, here's an actual robot. Uh, the, so this is a Calinon at IDIAP. Uh, it's uh, uh, a robot which uh, can interact with humans, in fact, so a very interesting one for collaborative work. More, more recently, we keep uh, refining the, the, the models uh, we have access to. Uh, so here's a, just a few papers to give you a feel for that. Uh, in particular, we more recently, we, we've explored uh, uh, how to embed such an understanding of the kinematics with uh, so-called uh, um, recurrent neural networks, RNNs. Uh, so basically the neural network here is, is there to capture uh, the, the different parameters that are, we need to set to uh, perform a, a particular rendering. Uh, and then what you have is with the, the neural network is that you can start uh, render with the same targets, many different versions, uh, essentially combining a set of targets for uh, different potential artists. Uh, so the, the, the kinematics of different artists can be, if you want, captured by the neural network during a training session and this can then be used to do rapidly many versions of, of the rendering. So where next? I'm reaching uh, soon my conclusion. Uh, where next with this research agenda? So the, here's a few topics uh, we, we're thinking and uh, start, some of them we've started to explore. Uh, so we are looking at uh, how to relate uh, image uh, data uh, that could be used in this context and studied in this context. So the, the challenge here is to map uh, image information or intensive information into strokes. Uh, how do you go from uh, a painting, let's say, so a very dense field or image uh, and recover um, these gestures that we've studied in the context of calligraphy. So in calligraphy or graffiti, typically the the strokes are, are very obvious, very present, and the image processing uh, that we can use that exists uh, is sufficient uh, to recover this. But if you consider uh, image-like data or painting-like data, the, this, is, this remains a challenge. So this is part of our current research agenda. An area we uh, ourselves have not explored, but others uh, have started to explore is uh, the sense of touch. Uh, so that's missing from our uh, current uh, model. And I think that's also a very interesting area to combine here, uh, haptics and sense of touch and how pressure influence gives you another kind of feedback uh, in, in the, the, the rendering of these artifacts. Uh, human machine collaborative modes of explorations, uh, we've started to, to study, but that's an open area also uh, to, to, to engage with. Uh, so this is more in the application domain of, of this kind of research. And of course, uh, we plan to continue to work with different artists uh, in order to try to unlock different uh, aspects of intelligence. Uh, 
So uh, my last slide, um, sort of more of a general uh, pitch. I hope uh, you will find this uh, convincing with uh, the few examples also I've given you. Uh, from an historical point of view, uh, if we look all the way back in the past, all the way to uh, even prehistory, uh, we see that art and machines, back then it would be simple tools, have actually co-evolved uh, together. So we, we've actually started to design tools and then later machines uh, in the context of art practice, not just art, but that has been one of the drivers. Our history is one of continuously extending our cognitive horizons. So I actually believe that, uh, or I would pitch the idea that uh, this kind of uh, research uh, is actually also helping in uh, exploring other ways of doing art or performing art. And this is yet another way to expand our so-called cognitive horizon, which is a particular view on uh, what intelligence is about. And we could have a long discussion here on what we mean uh, in this sense. Uh, and, and, and final, uh, final point, uh, art is a distinctive aspect of human intelligence. It is one of these aspects which is uh, very particular to the human species. There are very little examples of anything artistic uh, in other, being done in other uh, species. Uh, you, you, you can see uh, some species, uh, birds, for example, who have some notions of uh, art, apparently, uh, but they're very limited. So this is one of our distinguishing feature, art. It stands at the roots of many other distinguishing features, if we consider what distinguishes us from other species. Writing, for example, writing emerges long after the origins of art and is a di uh, direct um, outcome of art. So if you think of hieroglyph, symbols, in the context of semiotics, uh, architecture, in terms of drawing, sketching, engineering, even mathematics in terms of the Greeks, for example. And I believe, or I, I would like to uh, convince you that it deserves a place of choice in the future of AI and robotics. Thank you. And there might be a minute or two for uh, one or two questions. Of okay. Dear Frederic, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Yes, uh, we, we, we already are out of schedule. Uh, Yes, Sorry but, about I, that. <laughs> but I would like to ask you one question also. Maybe somebody also will ask. Uh, uh, now uh, there is a lot of attention and application of this uh, uh, machine learning technologies and especially deep learning uh, technologies. But uh, as far as I understood, you, you do not use these, uh, these uh, methods in, in your project. Uh, at least your robot drawing project was uh, uh, it's uh, maybe a bit early uh, uh, 1930 or 2013 uh, uh, you did the robot drawing problem uh, projects but uh, now do, do you also combine this uh, machine learning approaches in in, in in your in your projects or, or not Yes, uh, in fact, yes. So um, there were a few slides where we, we mentioned uh, some work with machine learning. Uh, so yes, we, we've engaged with it in the last few years. Uh, it's, you're right that uh, in the first project that I presented, we, we were not considering machine learning at the time. Uh, of course, back then, 2010, 2013, it's still not, uh, machine learning uh, is not uh, present as it is uh, nowadays really starts to emerge around 2015, let's say, and influence uh, many other fields. Um, but yes, we, we've engaged with it and we're doing more uh, in the combination of machine learning and, and some of the work we do. So for example, the work with Sylvain Calinon at EDAP uh, includes some uh, machine learning approaches. Um, We've done some work on using uh, recurrent neural networks, which I briefly mentioned in one of my slides. Essentially here, we are trying to capture a notion of memory. Uh, we, so we use the neural network approach to uh, 
uh, embed uh, memory of uh, how different artists use differently uh, their uh, movements. So it's uh, part of the kinematic model, modeling. Uh, so essentially the idea is that then you, what you can do is you can uh, have, uh, let's say, an agenda, a different set of targets. You're going to draw a, a particular letter, let's say. And the neural network is able to render these uh, targets uh, with the style of many different artists because it has been trained to capture the kinematics that characterize the style of each of them. So, of course, the, the assumption here it goes back to the hypothesis that uh, the kinematics, how you actually move when you draw, is fundamental to uh, the quality of the trace uh, that, it, that is produced. Um, okay. And that's an influence from uh, the world of Definitely. Okay. Uh, well, but this is since, since uh, uh, Frederick, we, we do we we do not have time because uh, the next ah, next yeah, session will be in in in, in three minutes. Uh, I, I would like uh, to thank you very much for for your uh, exception for uh, to our invitation to participate oh, in, oh, in our you. conference. Uh, thanks a lot. But thank you, thank I, I hope to see you also at, at this panel discussion. You also agreed yes. to uh, to participate. Yes. Thank you very much once more. Thank Goodbye. you, Frederick. Yes. Goodbye. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. So uh, uh, yes, uh, we will hope to see you, dear Frederick, in, on on Friday because uh, we will have a panel session. According, uh, well, we, which will be, which will be. Um, about AI and ethic issues and something else. So we'll see. Uh, you're brave because we have luck with London in two hours. <laughs> so you need to, to, to stand up early uh, to be with the panels, uh, pan other panelists, but still. So thank you again. Um, now mm, I would like to announce that we have a little, very small uh, breathing break and we'll come back in uh, just 12.00. Uh, and we will have the first session uh, A1 in our conference. So see you, see you after the break. Thank you. <laughs>